Psalms 135, we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, O ye servants of the Lord, ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for the good singing, the good prayer time, the good time of fellowship. We thank you for being a good God. You truly are worthy of our praise or admiration. Lord, you're worthy of our best. For you gave your best when you bankrupt heaven, when you sent your darling son to Calvary to die for our sins. Father, we love you, we bless you, and we thank you for your excellent greatness. Now, I pray you'd help us tonight. Again, Lord, uh, your people have labored hard this week. They've faced adversity. They have found themselves in the house of God tonight, and I pray you'd refresh them. Lord, you'd lift them up, edify them, encourage them in the faith, and God will thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice a few things about these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, who is to be praised? Who is to be praised? Uh, Notice it doesn't say praise the preacher. Notice it doesn't say praise the singers. Praise the Sunday school teachers. Uh, uh, praise uh, uh, the biggest donor in the church. Mm, doesn't say any of those things, but yet in my travels and going to a lot of church, they spend a lot of time bragging on those folks. But notice what the Bible says. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Look verse 3. Praise the Lord, uh, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for his is pleasant. Uh, All honor, all glory, all praise belong to Him, for without Him we can do nothing. He truly is worthy to be praised, and He is the one that we are to praise. Now, who is to be doing the praising? Now, we can read in the Bible where there are seraphim that fly above His throne, calling holy, holy, holy unto Him. Is that where the praise is to end? We can read... Uh, In eternity and future, there'll be a lot bowing before him, crying, worthy is the Lamb. Is that the extent uh, of praising? Uh, No, look again at verse number 1. It says, uh, um, praise ye the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, O ye servants of the Lord, uh, ye that stand in the house of the Lord, uh, in the courts uh, of the house of God. We're to do the praising. We can't expect the world to praise Him. The world don't know Him. Uh, But if you've been saved by the good grace of God, uh, uh, we sang that hymn earlier at Calvary. If you've been to Calvary uh, and your sins have been washed away uh, and you, my dear friends, have been made a joint heir to the throne of Christ, uh, 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 friend, uh, you are to praise the Lord. You say, well, I'm a little backward. I'm a little shy. Uh, Well, I understand that in your physical nature, your natural man, uh, but I've got good news for you. Uh, The Bible says uh, 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 that uh, uh, you became a new man in Christ when you got saved and that inner man uh, will help you praise the Lord. Now people praise in different ways. Some people are vocal. Some people praise with a gesture of the hand. Some people praise in the community when they are handing out tracts and those sort of things. But uh, listen, no matter what, you ought to be willing and ready to praise the Lord. My wife and I did a little shopping today. We was over at a store today, and and, and a fella come up, and uh, uh, just real friendly, real friendly countenance. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of unusual. Most people got a scowl on their face when you're shopping. You know, they know they're going to spend money, they don't like it, and they're in a bad mood, uh, and they want the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip, and somebody already got it, and they're just upset. Uh, not this fella. He was just happy, and, and uh, remind me a lot like Phil. Uh, just happy and just excited, and got to talking to him a little bit. Well, he turns around, he's got a backpack over his shoulder, and on it, it said, read the Bible. I said, I knew there was something about this fella I liked. Uh, 
And so we got to talking a little bit. And uh, he's, he's from me to Brother James. He says, hey, preacher, you know what James 14 says, don't you? And he just quotes it. And I finished it. And it's a blessing. Uh, uh, and we're just talking. Uh, I said, are you from Florence? He said, no, I'm from Michigan. I'm thinking, under God. And you still know God? What a blessing, huh? But I gave him a card. I said, hey, uh, if you ever coming through, come by and see us. Your blessing, huh? Uh, you can praise the Lord anywhere. You do know that, don't you? But if you can't praise Him in here, or out there, you, you, you don't, don't store it all up in here. Some of you just come in here and all you want to do is praise the Lord. But when you go out there, they need to hear the Lord being praised. They need to know God's done something in your life. Look at people. They're miserable. They have no hope. We ought to all stand out in a crowd. We ought to all have a good countenance. We ought to all have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Uh, right. And then I got to thinking when I was reading this, why is he to be praised? Well, look at verse 5. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did he in heaven. And in earth, in the seas, and all the deep places, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries, uh, who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast, uh, who sent tokens and wonders in the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all the servants, uh, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, uh, Og, king of Bashan, uh, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land for an heritage, and heritage unto Israel, his people, uh, Thy name, O Lord, endure forever in thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. Uh, uh, we find that he truly is great. Therefore, he ought to be praised. Amen. I mean, it took a great God to come to the gutter you was in and deliver your never-dying soul, did he not? Uh, Brother Brian back got crippled by a fall last night. Unlike Mephibosheth, nobody was carrying him. He went out in the backyard and stepped in a hole and about broke his leg. As he come limping in here. I'm glad he hadn't been crippled by a fall spiritually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't that long ago he was in the depths of sin, but God came by his way and yeah. saved him. That was a great God did that because he was a great sinner. It took a great God to save him. I'm glad we serve a great God. huh? Mm. Brother Donald stooped in religion. No. Uh, it was a good religious fellow, just lost. It took a great God to get him out of religion and get him saved. Isn't that wonderful? And some of you, you know where God found you. He's a great God. And that's why we ought to praise him. But then I want you to know something else about this psalm. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. We see who is to be praised. We see who is to do the praising. We see why he is to be praised. Why is praise so important? I mean, God is God. Why does he need us little peons praising him? It's not for his benefit. But it's important to understand praise is very important. I mean, the Psalms are full of praising the Lord. Yeah. Amen. But why is it so important? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because worship is generated from praise. Amen. This Psalm starts out five times we're instructed to praise the Lord. But notice how this psalm ends. Look down at verse number 19. It says, bless the Lord. Starts out praising the Lord. Yeah. Now it's saying, bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Bless, blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Uh, uh, praise uh, uh, turns into worship. Worship is generated from praise. Uh, when you start praising Him and bragging on Him and uh, uh, talking about how wonderful He is, uh, it smotes something in your heart and it causes you uh, uh, to turn to obedience and begin to worship Him and adore Him and exalt Him from your heart to the rightful place he deserves and that's his first place in your heart and praise will bring worship God help us to learn to praise for years for years I wondered why God blessed that church of God crowd the way he does now I'm talking about when I first got saved a lot of them still had the Bible I wondered why because I didn't have the right doctrine why would God bless them well, there's a lot of things they do wrong, Brother Charlie, but one thing they do right, they do praise the Lord. 
and he's promised to bless them that praise him. I would to God, we've got the book, we've got the right doctrine, we got, we're in the right place. If we'd really learn to praise him every day in our lives, boy, business pick up around our church. Hmm? I really believe that. Hmm? But I'm not going to preach on any of that stuff. I'm really not. I want to help you tonight. The Lord just kind of spoke to me. I had to drive up to Cincinnati yesterday, and the Lord was just dealing with me. And I was thanking him for it. And I got this thought on my mind. I want you to look with me. Verse 7. It says the Lord, and it's talking about him, He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. I mean, we serve a God that is not only God, He's God of the elements. He's the one that forms the clouds. He's the one that brings the rain. He's the one that sends the lightning. He's the one that ungodly sends that ungodly snow that we'll be getting soon. God's the one that forms all that. But you know, if we don't have snow, we won't have the pretty flowers in the spring. Hmm? God knows what is needed. And he forms all those things. But the first thing he talks about is the vapors. I got to thinking about that. And I got to thinking about... What those vapors really are referring to, it's referring to a fog, a mist. And fog comes about when you have moisture and it hits coolness. If you drive down the double A highway any morning in the next uh, week or so, you're going to hit heavy fog because it's cool in the mornings and you got moisture now this time of year hitting together and you get a dense fog. And I got to think about all this. You know, my mind sometimes goes a little crazy. I got to think about all this. And, and I got to thinking about why folks don't really praise him like he deserves and why that we really don't worship him the way he deserves. And I got to thinking about all this. And I want to preach on this thought for just a little bit tonight. I want to preach on when you're in a spiritual fog. Amen. Now listen to me. You can do your best to live right. You can read your Bible every day. You can pray every day. You can strive to do everything right. I mean, dress right, walk right, talk right, spit right, do it all right. But if you're not careful, a little moisture from heaven will come into your life, but a little coldness will come into your life, and you'll get in a spiritual fog. You can do everything right. You can come to church. Have you ever just come to church? And I mean, you come to church. You come, you're, you're being faithful. But while you're sitting here, it seems like everybody else is getting it and you're in a different room. You ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you're doing everything right? I mean, you're not, you're not living a wicked, simple... You're doing everything that, you know, the best of your ability, but it seems like no matter what you do, it just it's something isn't right. You're just going through the motions. I mean, you don't want to be going through the motion, but there's just kind of like a fog around you. Well, I got to thinking about all that. You see, when you're in a spiritual fog, your sight will be impaired. When you're in a dense fog, you can't see very far. And when you're in a spiritual fog, your spiritual sight's impaired. It is a dangerous place to be in a spiritual fog and then make a spiritual decision. Because you're not careful, you'll make the wrong one. Your sight will be impaired. And it amazes me when people get in a spiritual fog, Brother Clint, they just can't see it. They come to church, they're reading their Bible, they're praying. They don't get anything out of their Bible when they're reading it. When they pray, it don't hit the ceiling. But they're going through the motion, but they don't see that they're going through the motions. Amen. The little coolness has come in their life, and they don't understand it. They're not on fire for the Lord. They're kind of edging towards that lukewarmness. They don't understand they're in a fog because they can't see it. How many times do we have to preach on Sunday morning to the Sunday morning crowd about being faithful? Why don't they ever see it? Right. That's good. Why? I don't know. Now, Brother Lou never has that problem. He don't preach some on Sunday morning. They all come back Sunday night, Wednesday night, and all that and everything. <laughs> Why can't they see? 
Now, I know some super duper independent Baptists say, bless God, they're not saved. They might just be in a spiritual fog. They might just not see it's them. Hmm? I just know when you're in a fog, you can't see. Your sight's impaired. I know when you're in a fog, uh, shining a bright light doesn't help. You turn on a bright light in the fog, it gets thicker. And there are a lot of people, when they're in a spiritual fog, the problem is they turn on the light of their own understanding. And it gets worse. You're not to lean on your understanding. You're to lean on the Lord and His understanding. But when you're in a fog, you don't do that. You try to figure out why you're in a fog. And you use human reasoning to try and figure out spiritual things. And it doesn't work because your, your sight's impaired. And you're trying to shine the wrong light. They do have something called fog lights. Bright lights won't help you. I thought about this. When you're in a spiritual fog, it gets spooky. Listen, I get real concerned when I start feeling myself getting cold on God. That is a spooky place. Now, I know that never happens to you. You know, you got your halo on tonight. I know that. But I'm going to just confess something as a pastor. There are some times I get a little cold. There's some times I start realizing I am pressing and I'm not letting God do it. There are times I realize that uh, I'm not exactly in the right mindset uh, when it comes to doing spiritual things. Uh, but when I get uh, uh, to the point where I start feeling like I'm in a spiritual fog, that spooks me. Uh, why do you think every scary movie has fog? Because it's spooky. There's something about not knowing what is right in front of you. Hmm? That's why I worry about all these contemporary churches have all these fog machines on it. That ought to warn people. It's spooky. Run from it. Listen. When you're in a fog, there's no perception. You don't know how far something is away. You don't know what's around the corner. We went and watched Sid play ball the other night, and we we're zipping through Double A Highway. Thank the Lord the police weren't on the Double A Highway on Monday night, but I counted 13 deer on the edge of the road. Those are the ones I could see. Now, if I was in a fog, I wouldn't have known the danger. You lose all that perception. I thought about this. I'm talking about it's spooky when you're in a fog. Not only do you lose your perception, you lose your pep, your drive. You can tell when you're in a spiritual fog when you just come to church, but you don't have church. When you endure church and you don't enjoy church. You're in a fog. You're losing your drive. When the preaching doesn't excite you to go and make a difference, but you just sit there. Amen. There's a great, great need in our churches of folks applying the truths of God's Word and applying the preaching instead of just listening to it. And a lot of folks just listen to it because they're in a fog. They lose their pep. They lose their drive. Can I say this? When you're in a spiritual fog, you will lose your peace. It's spooky because you don't have peace. Can I say this? You can endure anything when you've got the peace of God. But when you don't have peace, it ought to spook you. Amen. Something ought to concern you. A spiritual red flag ought to go off in your heart. Something is not right. Why am I in this fog? Well, I thought about this. When you get in a very dense fog, everything will come to a standstill. Amen. And when you're in a spiritual fog, everything in your spiritual life comes to a standstill. You don't get anything out of the preaching. You don't get anything out of your daily reading and devotion. You don't get anything out of your prayer life. You don't. Everything just is standing still. 
Now listen, sometimes God will be in the shadows and He doesn't make His way clear, but you got peace. And then sometimes you can't find Him and you have no peace. Hmm? Everything comes at a standstill. You can try to be as spiritual as you want to be, but nothing's happening inside. Well, if you're honest, there are times you go through your Christian life and you're trying to do right, but just seems like there's a disconnect somewhere. You might just be in a spiritual fog. So how does one get out of the fog? How do we get out of our spiritual fogs? Well, first of all, it's been a time-tested way. The way that folks get out of fog is through sound. Them big ships, when they'd hit the, come, come close to the shore and there's a dense fog, they sound a fog horn to let them ships know how many fathoms they are. And the closer they get, they can measure that and know how close they are to the shore so they don't run their ships uh, 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 into the shore and bust their ship up. There's something about sound that will help you in a fog. When you're in a fog, quit trying to see your way out of it. Quit trying to think your way out of it. Quit trying to overthink your way out of it. Quit trying to use your understanding and start listening. Uh, uh, get to the point where you say, God, I'm in a fog. Uh, I'm going to wait right here till I hear from you. God, help me. Uh, and when you begin to pour out your heart to God, needing His help and seeking His face, uh, uh, when you admit that uh, there's some coldness in your life, there's something that's not right, uh, uh, friend, you just wait to there, uh, and God will start speaking to you. Uh, listen, all of a sudden the Word of God comes alive again. Uh, all of a sudden the preaching uh, does something for you again. Uh, all of a sudden the Spirit of God within you uh, will illuminate your mind and heart uh, and the fog will begin to dissipate uh, and God and the things of God will become real again, my dear friends. Amen. Uh, the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. But listen, God speaks to us through His Word. Amen. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You'll get out of your fog through sound. I have learned when I feel that my soul might be getting a little cold towards the things of God, that I need to admit to God that I'm not where I should be or there's something going on. I may not understand what's going on. I'll ask Him to show me and I begin to listen. And God is faithful to let us know right where we are with Him. Can I say this? When you're in a fog, how do you get out of it? Through sound. And then when God begins to speak, you take small, sure steps. When you're in a fog, you don't want to leap you might jump off a cliff. Just start following His voice, taking very sure, stable steps towards Him. Amen. Draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. Amen. Listen. Take sure, small steps. Take those steps you know that God has set a foundation for you. Can I say this? When you're in a fog, how do you get out of it? You've got to be sensitive. A lot of folks never get out of fog because they don't know they're in a fog. You've got to learn to be sensitive. You've got to learn to have a litmus test to try the spirits, whether it be of God, and you try your own standing with God through the Scriptures, and when you find yourself not measuring up, you've got to be sensitive to that. Now, some people, Brother Tommy, are over -sensitive. Preach on sin, they get mad, and they leave. Preached on sin one time, Tommy left for three weeks, didn't see him. Only come find out he went to Disney. No, I'm just eating. He didn't get mad. But some folks get real sensitive sure. when preaching and the things are going on. The preacher don't shake their hand or somebody says something to them. They're overly sensitive. That's the wrong kind of sensitive. Yeah. I'm talking about being sensitive to the things of God. You'll never get out of the fog until you learn to be sensitive. We're not saved by feelings. Sometimes the fog's so thick you can't feel you, you can feel the fog. Well you gotta learn to use your spiritual understanding to be able to feel the fog closing in on you. Amen. Realize, hey, 
I just don't have the joy I once did. I just don't have the spring in my step that I once did. It, the things of God just aren't as real as that. My, my prayer life's stagnant. My reading's stagnant. You've got to be sensitive to that. Because God doesn't change. Amen. Can I help you with something? You can live life. You can be faithful to the things of God, but life sometimes will cool your spiritual life. Amen. Hmm. Sometimes the hustle and bustle of life, sometimes the pressures of life, sometimes just uh, putting food on your table and clothes on your back and, and just uh, trying to uh, uh, fit everything in. Sometimes the Lord gets pushed to the back burner. And that's when you need to be sensitive to why you're in a fog. And then I thought about this. You're not going to get through a fog until you learn to submit to the things of God. There are some people that stay in a perpetual fog because they don't listen and don't put the things of God into practice in their life. You've got to learn to submit to the things of God. You'll never get out of fog. You'll end up somewhere out in left field if you're not careful. You've got to learn to submit to the things of God. You need to submit to His Word. You need to submit to His, to his church. You need to submit your life and your will to his will it's through submission that you'll get out of your fog as long as you want the reins of your heart and your life God will let you run with that but you're going to end up in a mess it's a great day in my life when I realize the Lord can do a whole lot better with the reins of my heart than I can Amen. but even being saved 45 years every now and then I find myself reaching for him are you listening Every now and then I, I have to remind myself that, you know, hey, the Lord knows best. Uh, sometimes I want to help him out. He don't need my help. Hmm? I mean, he made everything in six days and didn't ask me my opinion on any of it. He don't need my opinion now. Are you listening? We've got to learn to submit to the things of God. Some people are never experiencing the joy of the Lord because they have a submission problem. In their life, they just stay in a fog. They just stay in a fog. Listen. Said all that to say this tonight. If you're not careful. The things of God, although you love them, you love church, you love your church family, you love your Bible. Even God help you, some of you love the preacher. But if you're not careful, you start getting a little cold. A little fog come in your life. And if you don't take care of it, you'll get used to the fog. You don't have to live a foggy Christian life. You can live a victorious Christian life. You can live a joyful life. Why would you want to stay in the fog when you can absolutely have victory and joy and enjoy the things of God. I'm glad I enjoy being saved. Sure. Amen. Yeah. There's some people on Sunday morning, they just look miserable. Yeah. They say, Brother Doug, do you judge them? No, I, I actually feel sorry for them. You know why I preach to them like the way I preach to them, try and get them faithful? Because I want them to have all the blessings of God. Sure. But if I'm not careful, I can come three times a week and get cold on God. I don't want that. I want to say, Lord, and him say, yes. I don't like it when I have to get right before I can hear from the Lord. Are you listening? I want to, I want to, I want to stay right. I want to be right. And that's not always the case. Because we're still made out of flesh and bone. And sometimes even flesh and bone in his best intentions will lead you to a foggy place. So if you're here tonight, it's just been a little cool. I'm not saying you're cold and indifferent on God. I'm just saying it's been a little cool. Got a little fog going on. You can get out of the fog. You've got to ask the Lord, Lord, help me. I'm in this fog. I don't want to be in this fog. Lord, help me. And just be real sensitive and listen. He'll help you. Huh? David cried, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And the Lord did. And God's no respecter of persons. If he'd forgive David and help David, he'll forgive you and help you. 
maybe it's just been a while since you felt his touch. Well, I don't like it when it's been a while and I haven't felt his touch. I want to feel his touch. I don't like it when it's been a while since I just, you know, he hadn't blown through and helped us. You know, are you listening? I don't like it. And when that happens, a lot of times I find myself in a corner somewhere saying, God, is it me? Have I got a little cold? Well, I want his touch. I want his presence. Mm-hmm. Say, preacher, I've asked God now. He hadn't showed me that there's anything that I need to repent of. But preacher, it's been a while since I felt his touch. Well, start doing what this psalmist did. Start praising the Lord. Just start thanking him for how good he's been to you. I believe we'd have revival if we'd truly just start thanking God for all His choice blessings and benefits on us. You start listening to Him and thanking Him for everything He's done for you. won't be long. You'll go from that praise to that worship aspect. And then who knows what God will do. But maybe tonight you're just, just in a fog. I've got good news. Jesus got the answer for your fog. And you can get some help tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. The Lord's been dealing with you about getting saved. No, it wasn't a salvation message, but I got good news. He's a salvation God. He came seeking to save that which was lost. And if you come during the invitation, we'll take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved tonight, friend. And oh, what a day it'll be in your life. Maybe here tonight, you're not in a fog, you're saved, you know you're going to heaven, you love God, you're excited about God, but maybe God spoke to your heart about something else. And I'd be a good night to get that taken care of. Let's go out of here praising and worshiping God and making a difference in the lives of those around us. Thrills my heart when folks request prayer for lost people. Now let's do something about it. Let's go live a life that is a beacon so others in the fog can see the light. God help us to be what we can be for Christ. Tonight, are you in a fog? You don't have to be. Are you saved? You can be. The Lord spoke to you about something else. Let God have his way tonight. Let's all stand, Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. While he's getting a song, God spoke to your heart, you come. Some are coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you, Lord. Even when we're in a fog, you come and you get us out of the fog. Lord, just going through the motions, you put zeal back in our lives. You can touch us and bless us with your presence. Give us peace. God, we're thankful for that. Lord, in a crowd this size, there's no telling the needs. And God, I know, Lord, you're able to discern and try the reins of the heart. God, I especially pray if there's somebody here tonight lost, that the sweet Holy Spirit would convict them and draw them. We'd see them saved. Pray for somebody here tonight. Lord, in a fog, you just help them. Maybe there's somebody here tonight facing something else. God, I pray you'd help them too. God, just speak to hearts. Have your way to this invitation. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.